And I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and for those of you that are brand new, uh, you don't know what, I mean, these big letters up here on the stage, R and E. That stands for something, and it's on the front of your bulletin as well. We're in a summer series called The Power of R.E. And, and what is the power of R.E.? Well, it's the power of repentance. It's the power of reconciliation. It's the power of redemption. All these words that begin with re. So this morning, we're going to get into another re-word. And, and, and my re-word today has to do with three re-words. And, um, and the, very, the very thing that we're going to look at is that God wants to reveal himself to us. And God wants to rescue us. And God wants us to walk in a relationship with him. So, you know, I, I came up with a sermon title, Re, right? re Latte. But I thought that would be kind of difficult to say over and over again because we don't want to say, well, what was the topic of the message this morning? Revelescu latte. So for the more simple-minded of us, like myself, I want to talk about realign. To realign. You know, in our nation, we've got some deep problems. I mean, it's not enough that we're having to listen to all the political mess that's going on. But things have been compounded with those who have been killed this week and by those who have committed those murders. It's odd to me that last year at the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Columbus, Ohio, that in our great time of Great Awakening prayer meeting, a uh, two-and-a-half or three-hour prayer meeting with 7,000 people involved that would spend time on racial unity, and then there would be the Charleston, South Carolina murders in the Charleston church. And this year, that we would do the very same thing, further emphasizing and pushing, and then within a few weeks, we begin to hear of these kinds of things. Dr. Jerry Young, along with Dr. Ronnie Floyd, both leaders in Baptist life, had this to say concerning the incidents this week. Dr. Young is the president of the National Baptist Convention, which is um, traditionally black churches. And Dr. Floyd's been the president, just has um, finished his terms of office for the Southern Baptist Convention. And these men came together and led, and we as pastors all fall in and lead in this same way. But they said, once again, our nation is faced with the reality of senseless shootings. Mr. Philando Castile in St. Paul, Minnesota, Mr. Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and five policemen in Dallas, Texas. With the traffic and devastating news of these recent killings, along with seven others who were injured in Dallas, we're reminded that violence and retaliation are never the solution to our frustrations and anger. Our heartfelt thoughts and prayers are extended to the family of each victim. May all know that we are resolved as spiritual leaders in this nation to do whatever we can to help bring America together. May the wisdom of Martin Luther King Jr. provide us the needed encouragement today. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Now is the time to come together in love and unity, praying for America. America's in a mess. But as individuals, Americans are in a mess. And so Paul, he speaks to us, and he speaks to us about what I'm calling this morning a realignment. A realignment. To understand that this God that we've talked about, 
for years and years is a God who wants us to know Him. And in this prayer that he prays, as he writes to the Ephesians in chapter 3, in verse number 14, we hear these words. And he says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. We are God's creation, created in the image of Almighty God, red and yellow, black and white. It matters not where we've come from. We derive our name from God. That's the first thing he tells us. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through the Spirit in the inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That prayer tells me that God wants us to know Him, that we might know the, the breadth and the length and the depth and the height And that we might be filled with the knowledge and the love of God. Because we all derive our name from the very same Heavenly Father. We've all been created by the very same Creator. We stand together. My son and I were sitting on the back porch Friday night. We were batching it. We just finished eating a bunch of wings and tater tots. I cooked the tater tots. And he was saying, you know, I'm really concerned about our country. I think my jaw hit the floor because that didn't sound like his kind of talk. I mean, he talks, he's he's a Christian and he's studying to be a pastor and all that. But that's not generally what comes out of his mouth. And he began to talk about that. And he talked about how fearful, how fearful he is for the future of this nation, for his future when he meets his wife and for when he gets married and for when he has kids. The fear factor. Somebody take your Bible and open it to Psalm 27.1. I've got a word I want to share with you. Psalm 27.1. Whoever gets that, stand up. I want you to read it. Psalm 27.1. Okay, Laura, if you'll turn towards these folks and read it really loud. Just the first verse. Okay, so what's God revealing to us? He's revealing to us that we don't have to walk in fear, that He is our stronghold, He is our protector, He's, he's in our, he, we're in His presence, and, and He watches over us. He's a God that cares deeply for us. And you know, the most important thing in your life that you'll ever believe is what you believe about God. You know, some people ask these kinds of questions. Well, if God really cared, why did these things happen in Minnesota and in Baton Rouge and in Dallas? If God really cared. And and therefore, we get these ideas about who God is. But what we discover is that God is our stronghold. He's got it all together. He holds it all in His hands. He is the Lord God Almighty. But what you believe about God will affect you. It'll affect how you deal with your past. It'll deal with how you face your future and how you live today. And there's so many things that can distort our view of God. Whether it be the tragedies that happen in our land where it seems to be a senseless death, where it seems to be a, a senseless overdose. No matter what it may be, we, uh, we, our, our, our view gets shaped whether it's the media or painful experiences or what other people tell us. And most people have an inaccurate picture of who this God is. I I talk to people, and and some some people I talk to say, well, I don't believe in God. And I say, what are you saying? They're saying, well, I don't believe there is a God. I've got a friend who's an academic European. And uh, he told me one day, "I, I don't believe there's a God. And I said, well, either you're a a liar, or you're the most stupid person I've ever met. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, 
To tell me there's no God means that you've examined every particle in the entirety of the universe, and, and in that examination you have found that there is no God. Have you done that? And he said, well, no, others is impossible. I said, well, then, you know, you, you can't be an atheist from that point of view. And, 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 and stupidity would say there's no God. Well, I'm not stupid. I, there's got to be something. I said, okay. He, so you're not an atheist? He asked me, he said, well, what am I then? I said, well, at best, you're an agnostic. He said, okay, I'm an agnostic. And his view was shaped like that. Some people, they say, well, you know, when I think of God, I think of God like this. And anytime somebody says that, they're not taking on a realistic view of God from what the Bible has to say because their view is distorted. And in that distorted view, what they've done is they've set up an image that is not the image of Almighty God. And so failing to understand what God is like, you know, we either deny Him or we distort Him. And, and, and what really matters is not our denial and it's not our distorted view, but what matters is truth, what truth has to say. Now, there's a lot of truth in our world that has a lot of different mixtures in it. You know, it's kind of like, um, say... For lunch, you go over to, and you want something light, so you go over to Firehouse Subs, right? And in Firehouse Subs, you serve your own drink. And so you get that cup, and you put it there, you put it and, you know, get ice, and it's one of these machines, you mash all these different buttons, you can have all kinds of combinations, right? And, you know, some people like some really weird combinations. But it's all these different mixtures. And some people try to put mixtures on, on the Bible, what the Bible has to say. But the Bible stands alone as truth without mixture of error. Truth without mixture of error. So what matters is what the truth has to say. Now last weekend we talked about how God knows us, about how God watches over us, about how God sings over us, about how God cares for us, about how God knows how many hairs are on our head and how many have fallen off. And, and so, you know, how do I know that God really cares for me if this is the kind of God that we serve? Well, the answer is that God has proven His care for you and for me repeatedly over and over in countless ways. And, and today I want to look at three of those ways. And the very first thing that He, he shows in this reveal SQ latte, or what's the other word? Realign, is that He reveals Himself. He reveals Himself to us. And, 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 you know, there's only one way that you and I could ever know anything about God. If that's, that is, if God chooses to tell us something about Himself. If, G, if God didn't choose to let us know what He's like, none of us would have the foggiest idea. For our human mind to try to understand God is kind of like for our, our dog, Nene, the little pug, to try to understand a human. It's impossible. And so, fortunately, God wants us to know about Him. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Two of the major ways in which God is working in our lives uh, to call us into rest is through creation and through redemption. Well, think about how God reveals Himself in creation. In creation, one of the things that we discover about God is God is very, very organized. Ever thought about that? I mean, you look in creation, God is beautifully organized organized. Every star is in its place every day. It's never out of place. Now, it's not that way when you go into a child's bedroom. You know, uh, if, if they've been in there and they've been playing with their toys, there are pieces of whatever all over the floor. You know, I've, I've told my little ones before, you know, whatever's left on the floor goes in the trash. It's amazing how that helps them pick it up. But then from there, they become teenagers and and, uh, you know, there's clothes all over the floor. You know, you're stepping over things to get in there. And God is organized. Now, some people might walk into my office and say, well, Pastor, he doesn't look very organized. I know where everything is in every stack most of the time. But the reality is, is we're not organized like God, but God is ultra organized. And something else that we discover about God is God is powerful. You know, the, the power of the sun rising and the, and the sun setting and, and the power of nature and the wind and the ocean waves and, and in, the, in the single storm. We see the power of Almighty God. 
And God is creative. God loves variety and He likes different things. There's all kinds of different species and all kinds of different smells and all kinds of different tastes. God is a very creative God. And we know that God loves beauty. The sunrise, the sunset. We know that God... works in nature to show us who he is. And he's got a a sense of humor. I mean, look at some of these animals. I mean, they're just plain funny. Remember what you looked like in the mirror this morning? God has a sense of humor. And, 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 And in marriage, God seems to put opposites together. You ever notice that? And, and he has this sense of humor, but what we learn in creation doesn't tell us everything that we need to know about God. So the other side of that knowledge comes through incarnation. That is, 2,000 years ago, God came to earth in human form so that we could understand him. If God wanted to speak to ants, he would have come as an ant. But he didn't come as an ant. God wanted to communicate with people like you and me. And he came as a human. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's the focal point of history. That 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. And we date everything from this. He shaped our modern world. Every time you write the date 2016, you know what you're doing? You're, you're, you're dating it from the time that God invaded our human existence. And what did he come as? Jesus said in Luke chapter 2, 32, as a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Revelation to reveal. The New Living Testament says that he came as a light to reveal God to the nations. Jesus came for the purpose of revealing God to us. Isn't that amazing? He came to reveal God. And, and, and he came to earth in human form. And that's what God is really like. And, and in, Col- in Colossians, Jesus, uh, or the, Paul writes and says he's the image of the invisible God. So Jesus Christ came to reveal what God is like. Now, get this. You and I have never seen God. No one has ever seen God. But Jesus came as the image of the invisible God in order to show us what God is like. And so Jesus makes this declaration. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now, that's a pretty audacious statement, is it not? Whoever has seen me has seen the the Father. Now, Jesus made a lot of amazing, audacious kinds of statements. He said, I am God, repeatedly. I am God. He said, I'm the only way to heaven. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by me. He said, I'm the door. I'm the bread of life. I'm the water of life. He said, I'm it. If you've seen me, you've seen God. That's pretty audacious. And so that brings up a critical question that that all of us have to give answer to. Was Jesus Christ telling the truth? Was he telling the truth when he said, I'm God and when you see me, I'm what God's like, and I'm the only way to heaven. Was well, he telling the truth? You see, the big question that you've got to settle, the big issue in your life is this. Is Jesus Christ God, or is he a fraud? Is he God, or is he a fraud? You know, a lot of people, they want to say that Jesus is a great man. He's a great teacher. He's a great prophet, but that's not what Jesus Christ said. He said, I am God. Is he for real? Or is he the biggest liar that the world has ever known? He said, I'm going to prove it. He said, I'm going to be crucified on a cross. I'm going to be stretched out. Nails are going to be driven into my hands and my feet. That cross is going to be stood up and dropped in the ground. I will have gone, undergone great suffering and more suffering is to come. And I'm going to die on that cross. But in three days, I'll rise from the dead. Day one, day two, and day three. They go looking to the tomb to finish the burial process, and he's not there. He's not there. Why? Because he rose from the dead and came back just like he said he would. 
Now, some of you don't know this. Some of you do. You've heard me teach it before. That burial cloth was folded and laid in the tomb. It wasn't just ripped off. And that culture to, to fold the napkin meant that person is coming back. He's coming back. And just like he came back from death, one day he's coming back from heaven. And the Bible says at that point, every eye is going to see him. Every eye is going to see him. And so Jesus came on this mission and he rose just like he said he would. And, and what do we know about God because Jesus came? We, we come to understand that, that God made us for a purpose. We come to understand that our life is, is not an accident. We come to know that God has a plan for our life. Even Jeremiah had declared that, Behold, I know the plans for you, declares the Lord. We come to understand that God loves us deeply, plans for your welfare and not your destruction. We, we come to know that He's seen every moment of our life. He cares for us. And, and even though we're deeply flawed, and even though we've blown it, He still loves us. That's amazing. Because every one of us have blown it. Anybody blown it this week? Anybody recognized how deep your flaw is? I was playing golf with my son Friday. We went over to Rocky Bayou to the Country Club, which is a private course. But it was opened up, you know, for regular folks like us, 25 bucks. We're saying, how do we get in here so cheap? Well, they've got temporary greens. But we said, oh, we'll have fun. Man, these fairways, they're wide open. And I found that, you know, I just like finding the rough over and over again. And every time the ball hit the rough, it just came to an abrupt stop. And I was getting really angry. And at one point I told him, I said, this is making me so mad I could cuss. Don't freak out. I didn't. But think about the flaw. Jesus said, to have it in the heart is to do it. Now think about that. As a pastor, I'm flawed. I'm not perfect. Don't tell my wife I said that. I'm not perfect. I have imperfections. I've blown it. But Jesus came to show me that God has a plan that overcomes my flaws. That He deeply cares for me. He deeply cares for you. And amazing things because of Jesus Christ that God cared enough to reveal Himself to us in such a way. When we get to Luke chapter 15, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks three parables, one right after another. One, two, three. And every one of these parables has to do with lost things. He first talks about the parable of the lost sheep. That the shepherds brought his sheep and they're in the fold and he counts them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Where's number 100? 100 missing. And that shepherd left the sheep in the fold, and, and he goes out and he finds that sheep, and he brings it back and puts it with the rest. So all 100 are there. And he calls his friends together, and he has a party because that sheep that was lost has now been found and, and reunited in the fold. And then we read about a, a widow who, who looked for her lost coin in her house, and she swept, and she mopped, and she dusted, and she moved everything, and she finally found that light last coin, that lost coin, and she threw a party. Neighbors, y'all come. This coin I had was lost has now been found. And then he tells the parable of the lost son. We know him as the prodigal son who ran off from the father. But the father had been looking for this lost boy to come back. And one day he saw him coming down the road. He was a long way off, but, and he couldn't see his face, but he, he recognized the gait of his walk. He said, that's my boy. And he ran out and he hugged him and he robed him and he ringed him. Put a ring on his finger, didn't ring in his neck. And he told his servants, kill the fatted calf, the, 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 the best calf in the herd. This son of mine who is lost has now been found and he threw a big party. And Jesus came to reveal to us that God wants us to walk in relationship with Him. And He throws a party. The Bible says that every time a soul turns to God, that the heavens rejoice and the angels sing. He came for that purpose. And so here's the point. 
You matter to God. You matter to God, and He cares for you more than you know. You matter to God, and He cares for you more than, I, than you know. And so we go from the big reveal to the great rescue. God cares for me more than I know, so He's going to rescue me. God cares enough to rescue me. You know, as a, as a parent, I've had to rescue my children from time to time. I remember when my boys were little, they were in swimming lessons over at the Destin Athletic Club on Airport Road back when it was there. And, and they're in the water, and, and my second son was there just a bobbing. Nobody saw him but me, and, and I'd stop by on my way from the office heading home, and I ended up jumping in the pool, pants, shoes, wallet, everything, and pulling him up. I rescued him. I remember my daughter Lydia ran away from home one time. It was winter. She wasn't very smart. She didn't wear a jacket. She's probably six years old. Out the door she went, I'm leaving. I let her stay out there a little while, and I go to call her, and she's not there. She's not answering me. So I start searching. I start getting a little panicky because it's cold and it's wet, hypothermia and all that kind of stuff. She didn't answer me, didn't answer me. I went around another way, and she came out of the bushes. Oh, boy. She didn't answer. I can't tell you what I did, but I did rejoice that I found her. I've been on that kind of rescue. As a pastor, I've rescued parishioners. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the rescues I've been on with people that have been a part of the church and a part of the community. I've been on that rescue. And God has come so as to rescue us. What does He want to rescue us from? He he won't send Jesus to rescue from the guilt of our past. I've never met anybody who didn't have a past. I've never met anybody who never blew it. Everybody's got a mistake. We're all imperfect. We've all blown it. We've all broken God's laws. And when you break laws, you, you pay the penalty. You know, like you were driving here on vacation, and you got pulled over and got a ticket. Did that happen to anybody? You can be honest here. Wow, this is a great driving crowd. Nobody got it. Did you talk yourself out of one? Anybody ever had a ticket? Amen. You know, we've all had that. And so there's a law that says that ticket's got to be paid, right? And and so, you know, you pay the fine and and, and so on and so forth. Well, when we break God's law, that that ticket's got to be taken care of. And Jesus paid the price, and he paid the price to set us free from the guilt of our past. Now, here's the good news. Christ died to rescue us from the penalty of our sin. And and so, you know, we don't have to carry that penalty. We don't have to carry that, that guilt. You know, last night in Building 9 Worship, I I was standing there in worship. I was standing right down to the left of the pulpit in the worship area or the worship time. And and, and we were singing the Great I Am. And I was just enjoying the worship so much until I heard this whisper in my ear. You're not worthy to bring Him praise. You wanted to cuss on the golf course. That's what I heard, right? I had to stop for a minute. Hands down, okay, God. I'm your child. Thank you for loving me. Forgive me of my sin, both that which I know and that which I don't know. Keep me fresh in the blood of Christ. And by the way, Satan, shut up. And back to praising. You see, Christ came to set us free from guilt. But he also came to bring this rescue meaning to life as well, to rescue us from a meaningless life. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. You know, most people, they never know what life is. They get up in the morning, they go to work or they go to school, they get home, they eat, they go to bed, they get up the next day and they do the same thing over and over again. They don't know the meaning of life. My son got called the other night to come to a home of one of his good friends from high school that he thought was doing so well, the parents found the boy passed out in the bathroom with a needle in his arm. And meaning's not in a needle. 
How many young people have I known that have died because of the needle in the arm in the bathroom when everybody else thinks they're getting over it? Well, Jesus came to rescue us from a meaningless life, and and so my son Chris, he said, you know, there's no rehab program that's going to bring him out of this. The only thing that's going to bring him out is a faith in Jesus Christ, and the only hope for your family is Jesus Christ. Jesus is our help, and he brings meaning into our life. He said, I came that they may have life. Life. And Jesus wants to rescue us from the fear of death. He, the Bible says in Hebrews, came to set us free, all who've lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. You know, the fear of death is a general fear all over the world. Anybody want to die right now? Hello? There's none of us. But Jesus came to set us free from that fear of death. You know, if you ever want to blow somebody's mind, you know, uh, say, hey, come to our house. We're going to have a party tonight, and we're going to talk about death. People will avoid it. But I want you to hear what Jesus has to say concerning death. Jesus says in John 11, I am. I am. He made another audacious statement. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And, 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 you know, death will be the end of your body, but it won't be the end of you because you were made to live forever. You know, you're different than a plant. A plant, you know, can't think. A plant can't know God. All a plant is is a body, right? And you're different than the dog. The dog's got a body, and it can run around, and it can, <laughs> as it does this time of the year. But it can't know God. It doesn't have a spirit. But God says that you, you're the crowning jewel of His creation. You're created in His image. He gave you a spirit. And it's with your spirit that you can know God. It's in your spirit that God makes you alive. And so, here's the deal about death. We're all going to die. We're either going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. Some people have asked, do you still believe in hell? Absolutely. God said there's a place called hell place of fire and brimstone that's in eternal darkness where the fire burns and the thirst is not quenched and there's weeping and gnawing of teeth terrible place and if we've not been made spiritually alive that's where we're headed but he tells us that heaven can be yours that we can go to heaven And Jesus Christ, He came and He lived a perfect life and He died for our sins to take us to heaven. He is Savior. He is Rescuer. He is Jesus. And you know, there are people in the room right now that are facing a major decision. And without Jesus Christ in your life, you know, you're headed for a major crack up, a a, a major league disaster. Without Christ in your life, you're going to hit the wall one day. You're kind of like that person that's jumped off the 20th floor of a 20-floor building. You're getting down to about the fifth floor in that dive, and somebody says, how are you going? So far, so good. But in five more floors, you're going to hit the bottom. There's no need to hit the bottom. I know there are a lot of people who have to get to the bottom before they could ever look up to Christ, but there's no need to hit the bottom. And with that said, the God who reveals himself and the God who sends Jesus to rescue is the God that wants a relationship with you. He's the God that relates. He cares enough to relate to you. The reason for our existence is not to make money and retire and die. We were put here because God loves us and He wants us to love Him. He wants us to have a relationship with Him. And the most mind-blowing, amazing concept is that the God of this universe who hung every star in place, He wants to have a relationship with you and with me. But something happened. We turned our back on God. It's kind of like we, we blew up the bridge of relationship. 
and we can't get back to God. But Jesus came to lay down his life on the cross and rebuild that bridge that we might have relationship with him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling. He was reconciling. He was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them because they were counted against Christ, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. To reconcile means to bring back into relationship. I had a, a, a prayer request that came into my mailbox in the email this weekend from somebody I've never heard of, asking me to pray for the reconciliation between this woman and her friend who said she was like a sister but will not speak to her now. Reconciliation, relationship, it, it's so important. And it's important to God. And God wants to relate with you and with me. And so Paul would write to the Romans and say, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. But that reconciliation comes through relationship to God. And how do I have that relationship with God? You know, we're sitting in the room this morning, and we've got this intense sense that we need what this preacher has just preached. That's God's Spirit dealing with you and working with you and convincing you that this message is true. But now it's up to you. To look and say, God, I want to be in relationship with you. I want to be in relationship with you. Would you rescue me? Would you forgive me of my sin? Would you give me the strength to turn from this way of life that is not right? That I might honor you as Savior and as Lord. I can't pray that prayer for you. Only you can talk to God on your behalf. But right now, I'd just like for us all to bow our heads and just take that moment. You're saying, well, Pastor, I'm already a Christian. We'll pray for those that are not. But God would move in this room right now. And I'm praying that you would give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. You've never trusted him. You've never looked to him. And you need him so badly. Heavenly Father, I ask you to give those that you're dealing with right now the strength and the courage in following you. Father, may many souls be welcome into your kingdom this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand to sing. If you prayed that prayer, you're praying that prayer, would you just come and say, Pastor, I'm following Jesus. I want to honor him. I want to be baptized. I want to do all that I'm supposed to do of what God is asking me because of his grace. Would you come right now? Glory that you would be mindful of us. What do you see? It's worth looking away. We are free in ways that we.
aren't you glad that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us? I want to give you this word of encouragement as we get ready to leave this morning. The God, a reveal, lescu, latte. Boy, that sounds like a great Greek word, doesn't it? The God who wants us to realign has challenged us this morning to be realigned with Him. And our challenge is that we become messengers of reconciliation, realignment, as we go out in the world. Y'all are all involved with people that don't know Jesus. Be the light. Be the salt. Be the light. Be the salt. And all within us gives Him praise. I pray God's blessing be upon you. I pray His strength surrounds you. I pray that His glory overshadow you and that He brings us back together again next weekend to give Him that praise unless He comes first. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus.